Please sit. Good evening, everyone. I said good evening, everyone. The Lord bless you. And the Lord lift you up. And the Lord makes you so free that you'll do the work of God profitably in Jesus' name. Where are you? The work of God will prosper in your hand. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name. Thank you because we're always speaking to your people. We're asking tonight you will teach us and you will reveal your mind to every one of us in Jesus' name. We will make progress. Your work will prosper in our hands. You grant us a new anointing that will break every yoke in every life of our members in Jesus' name. Lift up your people. Enlighten your people. Encourage your people. And make us stand firm on the revealed word of God in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at... First John chapter 2, and I'm reading verse 28 first. First John chapter 2, <clears throat> reading from verse 28. And our little children abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Here John the Beloved is actually talking to all believers. He has mentioned, he had mentioned little children in verse 1. And then in verses 12 to 14, he spoke about little children and young men and fathers. But now as it comes to verse 28, he groups everybody together <clears throat> and he says, Now little children, abide in him. He's talking to everyone now. And he says, So that when Christ shall appear, that is Christ is coming again, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. It's not only telling the little children, the babes in Christ, to be ready for the coming of the Lord, or the young men to be ready for the coming of the Lord, or the fathers, those of age, to be ready for the coming of the Lord. He's not talking to everybody. And he's saying, <clears throat> let us abide in Christ. And abide in the experiences that we have. So that when Christ shall appear, when Christ shall come, talking about the rapture, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be caught together up with them in glory, that we will not be ashamed, you will not be ashamed. Our ministers will not be ashamed, our preachers will not be ashamed. At the coming of the Lord. Whatever then he says in the passage we're looking at is for one goal, is for one purpose that you will be ready, I will be ready, and everyone in the church will be ready for the coming of the Lord. If he gives a command, it's so that we can be ready. If he gives us warning, it's so we can be ready. If he gives us a promise, it's so that we can be ready. Tonight, we're looking at the message, the challenge of being rapture ready in these last days. The challenge of being rapture ready in these last days. The apostle, by inspiration of the Spirit, affirms and confirms that they were ready at that time, living in the last days. If they were living in the last days at that time, 
those of us who are alive now, we're living in the last hours of the last days. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. This is the last dispensation. There's no other dispensation that will come after this time. It is the last time. It is the last dispensation. It is the last period before the Lord will come. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Whereby we know it is the last time. And therefore in these last days is concerned. For the church is that the church will be rapture ready. That's why we have read verse 28. So that when he will come, none of us will be left behind. None of us will perish of the world. And none of us will be left behind in Jesus' name. The last time, in the last days in which we are living. Look at First Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 1. Here is Paul the Apostle reminding us that even at their own time, they were already living in the last days. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, is telling us of the activities of what will be happening in the last days. There will be seducing spirits. There will be spirits that will affect people and teach people, influence people, and seduce people into the doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. It's telling us that in the last days there will be some peculiarities. People will have hard hearts, seared consciences, as if their conscience had been uh, scared, had been seared with hot iron. There will be much hypocrisy in the last days. There will be lies and liars in the last days too. And as you look around, you can tell that those are the things that are happening in the days in which we are living, which tells us these are the last days. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. It's telling us that when we talk of the last days, there will be difficult times, perilous times. These last days will be days of the greatest challenge the church has ever faced. It's the they are the days preceding the coming of the Lord. Our highest duty will be that we prepare the church for the rapture. And our greatest preparation will be that we ourselves are ready for the rapture. And our greatest responsibility will be warning the people of the world and winning them to Christ so that they will not perish with the world. The last days are perilous days. They are days of deception. They are days of deadly distortions. The devil knows that he has only a short time. And because he has a short time, he's seriously very active to deafen and to deaden as many as possible so that they will not hear the true gospel. They will not believe the true gospel. They will not embrace the true gospel. That's the reason why the commands are coming to us, the warnings are coming to us, and the promises are coming to us. They are made to prepare and preserve the church for the coming of the Lord, for the rapture. In that second Timothy, chapter 3, verse 1, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. These are the characteristics of the last days. And as you watch, and as you see people, all they are thinking about is their own selfish end. 
their own selfish gain, their own selfish opinion, and they are self-centered because it says it will be the characteristics of the last days that men shall be lovers of their own selves, they will be covetous, boosters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Don't we see that today after you brought up children? And then you tell them this is the way to go, the way of life and the way of righteousness. Instead of going that way, they choose their own way. And you find that too, those of us who are parents in the Lord and those of us who are fathers and mothers in the Lord. And you are bringing up converts and you are bringing up members. And you say, this is the way, walk ye therein. It tells us that the characteristic of the last days is that people will be disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. You see that today, lovers of pleasure. Lovers of sport, lovers of games. If the game, if the sport coincides with church service, they rather go for the game and the sports. Because the sign of the last days is that people are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. Many people are churchgoers, they have a form of godliness. Many people will say, yes, they are Christians, they are people of God, they are sons and daughters of God. They have the form of godliness, but most of the people are nominal, nominal churchgoers, nominal Christians. They are only Christian in name, they have the form, the superficiality, the superficiality, but they do not have the spiritual life, but deny the power thereof. Tell me the last line there. I want you to hear yourself. Say it well. Say it as if you are going to do it. From such, turn away. Don't join them. And if you go to evangelize among them, don't tell them, remain where you are among the nominal Christians. Bring them out. Because it says, the people of the world, when Christ is about to come, they will have a form of godliness. They'll deny the power thereof from such turn away. We're coming back to First John chapter 2. And tonight we're looking at verses 15 all through to 29. I divide the passage to three parts. Number one, verses 15 to 17. Verses 15 to 17. Number two, verses 18 to 23. 18 to 23. And number three, 24 through to 29. The first point, the punishous affection of a lost, driven conformist. The pernicious affection of a lost, driven conformist. You see, there are people that claim to be members of a living church, of a Bible-believing church, of a gospel church, but the original sin they received, the original sin they believed, and the original sin they practiced. They are slowly going back, going back, going back until the world is like the church, and the church is like the world. And then, as you look at verses 15 to 16, 17, it talks about the desire, the affection, the tendency, and it calls it the lost. And the people of who say they go to church, they are lost dreaming. What drives them? What controls them? What motivates them? And what informs their decisions in life is the lost of the flesh, the lost of their eyes, and the pride of life. And they become conformists to the things of the world and the people of the world. Let me read to you from verse 15 to verse 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You see, that's what drives some people. That's what makes them conformists to the people of the world and to the things of the world. They are lost, driven. And what goats them, what pushes them, what makes them to take the decisions they take is because of the lust for the flesh, lust through the eyes, and pride of life. And the word of God says, all these are not of the Father, they are of the world. Look at verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the laws thereof. But she that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The pernicious affection of a lost driven conformist. As we look at those verses, see what we see there. Number one, command not to love the world. The command not to love the world. Number two, why are we not to love the world? Because of the corruption of the lust of the flesh. The corruption of the lust of the flesh. If there's the lust of the flesh, affection for the things of the flesh, concentration on the things of the flesh, forgetting your spiritual life, it brings corruption, the corruption of the lust of the flesh. Number three, the contamination of the lust of the eyes. Looking at this, looking at this, and looking at that, it attracts people. It sucks in people. It makes people to want to be like what they are seeing. They are contaminated eventually. That's why he's telling us not to love the world. The contamination of the lust of the eyes. Number four, the condemnation of the pride of life. When that pride sits on the throne of the heart, when that pride controls the language, controls the dressing, controls the posture, it brings eventually condemnation, the condemnation of the pride of life. Number five, the continuation in the will of God. If we are going to make it on the final day, we start by knowing the will of God. What's the will of God? Our salvation. What's the will of God? Our non-conformity to the world. What's the will of God? Our sanctification. What's the will of God? Our obedience to the word of God. And if we are going to make it on the final day, there must be the continuation in the will of God. Look at them one by one. We're looking at number one, the command not to love the world. The command not to love the world. Look at um, First John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world. There's nothing to adjust there. There's nothing to modify there. It is a straightforward command to members of the church, to ministers in the church, to men in the church, to women in the church, to young people in the church, to boys and to girls, and to everyone who claims to have a patch with Christ. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The things that are in the world. The things that are in the world. It's not just talking about dressing. There are people that have limited understanding of the commandment of God. I don't wear jewelry. And I don't uh, put on this, I don't put on that. I don't have lipsticks. And I don't uh, weave my hair as a man, weaving the hair like a woman. So I'm not of the world. I do not love the world. It mentions the things that are in the world. When your heart, your mind is centered on material things in the world, when you pursue material things in the world, I see that why your final salvation. I see that is the thing that will take you to heaven. It says you are loving the world. 
love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man, if any minister, if any member of the church, if anyone young or old love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The command not to love the world. We're coming to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 1. It tells us from verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, children of God, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. A sacrifice, you see, your service to the Lord, God should look at it like a sacrifice. You deny yourself of something. You give up something that you might have had pleasure in. You give up your right. You give up the things that would have got if you were not saved. It says that to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. And be not conformed to this world. You're not the person that is looking at the passion of the world. And there you say, that's what your heart is panting after. You're not the one that is looking at all the activities of people in the world. And then as you see them, I want to be in their position. I want to be in their place. And I want to enjoy what they're enjoying. It says, be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. If your mind is not renewed, if your mind is not transformed, if your mind is still the mind of the world, there is no way you can obey the command of the Lord if your mind has been influenced by the world and is polluted by the world. But it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. By the renewing of your mind, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Number two here is the corruption of the lust of the flesh. We're coming back to First John chapter two, verse sixteen. For all that is in the world, remember in verse fifteen it says. The things that are in the world, don't love them. Don't set your mind on them. Don't set your affection on them. And now he tells us in verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. That's the sin we're to take care of, the loss of the flesh. Why? Because if you love the lust, if you have the loss of the flesh, it will give you corruption. It will make you go astray. It will make you be defeated in your Christian life. Look at First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. We're reading from verse 11. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, talking to the children of God, all the children of God, the men and the women, the young and the old, the boys and the girls, if we're Christians, dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. The battle for our soul. The war against the soul. They want to make sure they corrupt the soul so that we don't get to heaven. But thank God we're getting there. Second Peter, I'm reading from chapter 2. Second Peter, chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 14. In verse 14, it says, Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease, that cannot stop from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and hearts they have exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children, not blessed children. They're just churchgoers. They're nominal Christians. And they say they know the Lord, but the loss of the flesh grabs them, grips them, 
draws them and pulls them into corruption. Look at verse 17. From verse 17 of that same chapter, these are wells without water. They are professors of religion without the grace of God. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. Whom, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they, they allure, they entice through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that are clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption. It's like they're slaves, they cannot help each, and they're totally drawn into this corruption. For whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. The lust of the flesh brings man, brings woman, brings the former believer into bondage, the bondage to the flesh. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through lost. They are again entangled if they have received the portion of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome, entangled therein and overcome that corruption, that loss of the flesh is seeking for the soul and sees them. They have a secret love, a secret desire, a secret pull towards the world. They love the dances of the world. They love the music of the world. They love the principles of the world. They love the politics of the world. They love the power play in the world. And because of that, secretly, their hearts are going after that. It says they're getting entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to some vomit again, and the soul, the pig that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. Let's come back to First John chapter 2. And here we're looking at verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. Again, it's telling us these are not of the Father. But they are of the world. And if the lust of their eyes will draw anyone, pull anyone, drag anyone, so that the things people look at, they are, they are going towards them. They look at their television. They look at their internet. And they see the things that appear interesting to their eyes. And all those things they see, which are not spiritual, all those things they see, which does not make them purer. All those things they see, which does not make them more righteous to the Lord. And they smile, they say, these people of the world, they have gone very far. Look at this one, look at this one, look at that one. And they are drawn towards those things. The lust of the eyes, it will bring destruction. Number three here, the contamination of the lust of the eyes. How was Eve deceived by the serpent through the loss of the eyes? That was the thing that she pulled her and made her to go astray. That's what caused the fall. And then she introduced it to Adam. It's good for husband to love the wife and the wife to love the husband. But we need to be very careful if the woman, if Eve has been sucked up, has been influenced, had been corrupted 
by the lust of the eyes, we cannot carry love in the family to the point of, well, is my wife introducing this to me? Is my wife that has gone to it? I remember the commandment of God, you will not teach eat of the fruit of that tree. But my wife was eating it and she said, her eyes are now opened and she's introducing it to me. No, you will be a person to rebuke that wife and to remind that wife she shouldn't have gone that direction. By the grace of God, you'll keep your wife in the faith in Jesus' name. I want to hear a good amen there. And if it is the man that has been looking at something in the office and has been drawn and drawn and drawn towards that scene, and the man is coming home now to say, you know, my wife, looks like we're being too rigid about, uh, you know, some things. Looks like we're being too serious about some things. I've been looking at things uh, and I'm wondering what's bad in this, what's bad in this, what's bad in this. The lust of the eyes has contaminated him. And the wife will not compromise. Sisters, you will not compromise in Jesus' name. And you will take your stand. If one will stand out of the tomb, the one standing will be able to lift up and bring up the one that has fallen. We will not fall. Genesis chapter 3, I'm looking at verse 6. And when... The woman saw the loss of their eyes, that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, lost of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, tell me the rest. And he did eat. I will not eat the forbidden fruit. No matter who is uh, trying to introduce it, I will not eat the forbidden fruit. You will not eat the forbidden fruit in Jesus' name. And young people who are just getting married, you know, sometimes uh, these are young people, they've seen the will of God to somebody in that other church, in that other church, in that other church. And some of those people, they're seeing the will of God too. They say they are born again. They say they are children of God. But they are not standing firm on the totality of the word of God. And when the marriage has taken place, I love you, I love me, I love you very much. I love you to the depths of my heart. And that one that is married from another church and now begins to introduce this and introduce that. And the husband says, you know, I'm deep alive. And you know, I believe the Bible. Look at this verse and look at this verse of the Bible. And the lady begins to cry. But you said you love me. If you love me, why can't you compromise because of me? If you love me, why can't you do this just because of me? If you love me, why can't you fall and go away from the commandment of the Lord just because of me? Can't you go to hell on my behalf? And can't you go to hell with me? Even if it means going to hell, I will not go to hell for anybody. I will not go to hell with anybody. The contamination of the lost of the eyes. Look at, uh, look at Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 21. Joshua chapter 7 verse 21. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. They pulled him. They drew him. They dragged him. They attracted him. Those things magnetized him. That's why we should be very careful what we look at. Very careful what we're gazing at. Very careful what we're setting our affection, our mind, or the eyes of our mind on. He said, when I saw I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Well, 
We know the result, and we know what happened. I pray that those things will not happen to us in Jesus' name. Number three, let's come back to this uh, first John chapter 2, reading from verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lost of the flesh, the lost of the eyes, and the pride of life. The pride of life. It says they are not of the Father, but of the world. Number four here, the condemnation of of the pride of life. The condemnation of the pride of life. Pride is very dangerous and it is condemned in every part of the Bible. Old Testament and New Testament. Let's look at Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. We're reading from verse Daniel chapter 4 reading from verse 13. In Bastachi of Daniel chapter 4, look at what it says. It says, The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Look at the language. Look at the utterance there. And look at the pride. And then he goes on to say, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. Pride makes people to lose the kingdom, lose your place in the kingdom, lose your position in the kingdom. Pride makes a person to be rejected by God from his kingdom. And they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and giveth he to whomsoever he will. The same hour was a sin fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his ears were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. Eventually, he came back to himself. Eventually, he recovered. After that recovery, what did he say? Look at verse 37. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, whose all whose works are truth. And his ways judgment. Look at what he said finally. And those that walk in pride, tell me, is able to abase. You see, Daniel had warned him after he interpreted the dream to him. And Daniel had told him what to do. But no, he will not do that. There are people that are going the wrong way. And yet, when the message comes to them, they cannot realize, this is me. There is the lust of the flesh. There is the lust of the eyes. And there is the pride of life. But they will not listen. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're reading from verse 13. Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. Better is a little child, a poor child, an inexperienced child, but teachable child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished will not be an old minister, an old preacher, 
an old Christian, an old member of the church that will no more be admonished in Jesus' name. We remain humble. We remain teachable. And the word of God will make the right impact in our lives in Jesus' name. The, what the Lord wants us to do, come now to chapter 2 of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. Reading from verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lost thereof. But he that doeth, has been doing it, he keeps on doing it. He that doeth, he that continues to do the will of God, abides forever. Our continuation in the will of God. Our continuation in the will of God. We will continue. I will continue. We will continue in the will of God in Jesus' name. Look at Matthew chapter 7. We're reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Keep on doing that will as is revealed unto you. Be happy, be joyful, be excited that we're in a church where the truth of the kingdom can be revealed unto you. Don't get offended. Sometimes the word of God will come to you straight. And sometimes the word of God will mention a blemish, a flaw in your life and will show you to go back to Calvary and get cleansed. Don't get offended and say, why did the word of God come directly like that to me? All right, if it doesn't come to you directly, who is it going to come to directly? If God loves you and he wants you to be in the center of the will of God so you can get to heaven and then he sends the message to you, why would you be offended? You will not be offended at the word of God. It's those who are proud who are offended at the word of God. It's those who are proud like an old king, a foolish king that will no more be admonished. Those are the people who get offended. But if we're going to get to the kingdom of God, there is no offense at the word of God. Give me a good amen. amen. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. That's why some people unteachable, pastors unteachable, prophets unteachable, miracle workers unteachable. They say, we cast out devils in his name. And then we have done many wonderful works in his name. We have prophesied in his name. And they do not know about salvation, about righteousness, about sanctification. Verse 23, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that walk in equity. You will not be a worker of iniquity. I will not be a worker of iniquity. We'll keep on doing the will of God. Continue in the will of God in Jesus' name. Point number two now. We're coming to First John. First John chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 18. First John chapter 2 verse 18. Little children is talking to all the believers now under that title of little children. It is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Antichrist shall come. The Antichrist is still to come after the rapture. During the time of the great tribulation, in fact, it is the presence of the Antichrist in the world that makes that period a period of the great tribulation, that the Antichrist shall come. Even now, there are many Antichrists. Antichrist, the one that is to come, 
after the rapture is sending for us some people he has influence that have the spirit of the antichrist the attitude of the antichrist the mindset of the antichrist it says whereby we know that it is the last time they went out from us they were believers before they were children of god before and it began Loving the world, loving the things of the world, having the loss of the flesh, having the loss of the eyes, having the pride of life. And when they are confronted that you cannot do this, you cannot remain in the midst of the people that stand for the totality of the word of God and continue like this. So they said, if that's the case, if you will not allow me to have my way, if I cannot have self-will uh, enthroned in my heart over here, if you will not allow disobedience, disregard to the word of God, then it means you don't want me here. That's why they went out. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Before they went out, their mind had gone out. They have, begun to, they have begun to despise the sound doctrine of the Word of God. They have begun to belittle the preaching of the Word of God. They were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And then he goes on talking about that. And he says in verse 26, These things are by reaching unto you concerning them that seduce you. Now there are some pastors uh, that do not understand that if somebody had been in our church before, and the fellow has now gone out because he did not agree with everything that was being taught in the word of God. They went out from us because they are not part of us. And then those people, some of them are bold, some of them are courageous, and some of them uh, will approach uh, some of our overseers and they will say, uh, you know, I was a member of Deeper Life, even a minister in Deeper Life, he walked in Deeper Life. And I want to tell you something. I now want to, I minister freely everywhere. I've gone to that gospel church. I've gone to that Pentecostal church. And um, can I come to deeper life and minister? What do we say? Can, can we allow them to come back and minister in the church? No, they didn't agree with the truth. If you allowed them to come back and minister in any local church of deeper life, they will seduce the people and they'll put that their message on the YouTube and then they'll write underneath it, I am pastor so and so, I was a member of deeper life, I was ex deeper life, but I left, but now I'm being invited to come and teach them something that they don't know. And then when our members see that, they say, okay, some people that went out, they've got extra knowledge and deep knowledge and high knowledge and great knowledge that now they're even allowed to come back and be preaching to us. You will not compromise with them in Jesus' name. Look at verse 26. These things have I reaching unto you concerning them that seduce you. Point number two now. The predicted antichrists in the plural. The predicted antichrists in the last day Christendom. In the last day Christendom. Christendom, like kingdom, king, kingdom, Christ, Christendom. The people that say they belong to Christ. But there is so much compromise that the antichrist that John the beloved spoke about, he said, little children, verse 18, it is the last time. And as ye he have heard that antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists whereby we know it is the last time. Look at chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 3, 1 John chapter 4. We're reading from verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not 
that Jesus is Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. Just like we believers have the spirit of Christ. And we think like him. And we walk after him. And we follow him. And we speak his word. And we obey his commandment. There are people on the opposite side of the fence. They have the spirit of Antichrist. And they think like the Antichrist. They oppose Christ like the Antichrist. They contradict Christ like the Antichrist because they have the spirit of Antichrist whereby we have heard whereof ye have heard that it should come. Even now already is it in the world. Even now already is the spirit of the Antichrist in the world. That spirit will not catch you. That spirit will not influence you. You know, there are people who say they are preachers and they come to their congregation and they look at a verse of the Bible and they say, I don't accept that verse of the Bible and I'm going to read it the way it should read. I don't accept the translation. I don't accept this. Then they will turn it around and they will make jest of it. Then they go to another verse and to another verse. And there are people that keep on going to such a church and listening to such a preacher. There are people that will go on the net and there are people that will have messages on YouTube. And even the title, before you listen, is supposed to Christ. And they will say, Jesus is not this, and Jesus is not that. And there are people that are inquisitive. They want to listen to the Antichrist. I will never listen to the Antichrist. I said, I will never listen to the Antichrist. And so we should understand the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. The predicted Antichrist in the last day Christendom. Look at Second John chapter 1. Second John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Deceivers will not get hold of you. They will not get your ear. They will not get your attention. You will not follow after them in Jesus' name. What are the characteristics of the Antichrist? Look at 2 Timothy, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. Let no man deceive you, as the Antichrist will come, as those having the spirit of the Antichrist will come to deceive. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, Antichrist, be revealed, the son of perdition. And these are the activities of the Antichrist who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God. When the Antichrist comes eventually, he will exalt himself above God, above Christ. That's why he is Antichrist. And there are people having the spirit of the Antichrist today and they are opposed to God. And without any shame, without any hiding, they say, yes, I've had that doctrine. I've even read verses containing, uh, you know, the word sanctification and holiness. But, you know, I go against it. I stand against it. And I will never preach it on my pulpit. And if anybody preaches sanctification, holiness, and says that we can be free from sin on this earth, I'm going to oppose that person openly and i'm going to contradict him openly i don't have any respect for anybody that will preach about the power of god that can make us godly 
and there are people that will be cheering them and there will be people that will be saying well you know that man is bold he can contradict anybody he can even contradict Christ that's not a bold a Christian is a bold antichrist antichrist will be bold look at that verse 4 or that is worshipped so that he as God seated in the temple of God showing himself that he is God he says there's no other God anywhere we are God too I am God that's what he will say I'm also Christ that, that's what they will say. There's nothing uh, peculiar about Christ. He's the Son of God. I'm the Son of God. And whatever He claims to be, I am. And there are people that will think that those, they're teaching faith. And that's the word of faith. When they are blaspheming, I pray that you will not be deceived in Jesus' name. It says, remember ye not, that when I was yet to achieve, I told you these things, and now ye know what that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Even at this time, the spirit of Antichrist is at work. The mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letters will ledge, he who hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked capital W there, that's the Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And then he tells us in verse 9, even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and what kind of wonders? Lying wonders. There are some people, they say, but you know, miracles are taking place there too. And some wonders are taking place there too. And they begin to introduce their members, members of the church. They begin to introduce them. Don't say, I told you, but you know, uh, since uh, we have prayed for you and you have not got uh, an answer and healing is so important it's important that you get healed and even if you are healed by the power of satan just get healed and if you remain alive maybe you'll come back and repent some people die in that shrine and they die in such a synagogue and they die like that and where do they go you go to hell. You will not introduce anybody to go to hell in Jesus' name. Look at verse 10. And with all deceivableness of righteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned those who are searching for miracles in the wrong places that they all might be damned those who are introduced to a darkness and they want to get a healing by the power of darkness and their conscience is taken away there's so much in a hurry i want to get healed i want to get children i want to get this i want to get that and they go to such places of darkness i pray if you have introduced anybody to any place like that run after them you'll bring them back in jesus name those who die there that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but have pleasure in or righteousness that's the work of the antichrist the antichrist will be dangerously active during the great tribulation christ predicted the coming of the antichrist the apostles also prophesied about the spirit of the antichrist and that spirit of the antichrist is deadly is already at work today deceivers and antichrist Cause number one, the falling and the falling away of believers. 
It caused people to fall, and it caused people to fall away. Number two, they overthrow the faith of those who listen to them. You have been believing the Lord before, and now they overthrow your faith. And then you say, I don't know whether Christ is coming now or not. I don't think Christ can come now. And you begin to give excuses. Number three, Antichrist and those who have the spirit of the Antichrist, they oppose God and they oppose godliness. They oppose Christ and they oppose uh, Christ-likeness. Number four, they demonstrate false miracles and lying wonders so that people who see them or people who go to them or people who secretly watch them over the internet on YouTube they see what is referred to as miracles and lying wonders and then their hearts are drawn away from the truth unto error I pray you will not be drawn away in Jesus name they deny Christ. Number five, they deny Christ and the efficacy of his sanctifying blood. Those antichrist, those who are opposed to Christ, they deny Christ and they deny the efficacy of the blood, the sanctifying blood of Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 29. Of how much sorrow punishment suppose ye Shall ye be thought worthy who have trodden on the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified? He was saved, he was sanctified, he was a child of God until he began to lend his ear, his mind, his heart to the false prophets and they convinced him. And he fell away. And now he, although he was sanctified before, he now counts that blood an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. So the spirit of Antichrist in those deceivers will also lead, make them to lead many away from the truth and from their steadfastness. Number seven will work for Satan walking against Christ and walking against the true church. Number eight, they will prepare the way for the coming of the real, final Antichrist. The final Antichrist that will come. I pray you will not be a party to anything involved with the spirit of the Antichrist in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 17. Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 17. And their words will eat as does a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. What did they do? Who concerning the truth have erred, saying, The resurrection is past already, and they have over and they overthrow the face of some. The overthrow the face of some. Let's come to point number three now. The powerful anointing for our life saving commission. We have a commission. And it's a commission the Lord has given unto us. And he has given us this commission so that our messages will save lives, will save souls, so that our teaching will save those who are still in their sins and those who are saved. Our teaching, our life, our emphasis will keep them in the way of salvation, in the word of God. For us to be effective for that life-saving commission, he gives us anointing. That's why point number three is the powerful anointing for our life saving commission. Let's come to first John chapter two. First John chapter two and we're reading from verse twenty four. First John chapter two. We're reading from verse twenty four. It says in verse twenty four, let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning uh, remain, shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son 
and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised to us, even eternal life. Verse 27, for the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. An abiding anointing. The anointing which ye have received abideth in you. And ye have known, ye have not, ye need not that any man should teach you. He's saying, when he says any man here, he's referring to those who are coming from outside. Because he himself is on the inside and is teaching the people. And he's warning the people. And he's uh, preaching to the people. He says in verse 26, there are those who have come and they want to seduce you. But he says you don't need them. You need not that any of those people should teach you. But the same anointing teaches you of all things. And it's truth. And it's no lie. Even as he has, it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him, the powerful anointing. That anointing will abide in your life in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, in verse 21, he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. It's not talking about somebody bringing a bottle of oil and anointing you. This is an anointing that is done by God himself. He has anointed us. He is God. Verse 22, who has also sealed us and giving the earnest, the deposit of the Spirit in our hearts. It's talking about the anointing of the Spirit. Second Corinthians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 5. It says, Now, he that has wrought us, he that has wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who has also given unto us the earnest, the deposit of the Spirit. That's the anointing right there again. Look at First Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. The anointing of the Spirit that comes upon us, that is the gateway to the gifts of the Spirit. It's talking about anointing, anointing, that it brings anointing to us. And the anointing is to make us to effectively carry out the work of God He has given unto us. That anointing will be activated in your life in Jesus' name. It will abide. It will be activated and it will work wondrously in your life to bring more souls to the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This anointing we're talking about is the gateway to the gifts of the Spirit. The anointing that he has given us. The anointing that abides, the anointing that is activated, the anointing that is appropriate for every area of ministry the Lord has called us to, that anointing makes us to be effective in the kingdom work He has given us to do. I look at chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, 
I would not have you ignorant. You've got the anointing, but don't be, uh, don't be ignorant of the gateway that is now to usher you to the gifts of the Spirit. Look at verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with us. The anointing makes you to have the gifts of the Spirit that you'll profit with us, and you'll profit in the Word of God. Verse 8, for to one is given, number one, by the Spirit, the Word of Wisdom. Number two, to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Number three, to another, faith by the same Spirit. Number four, to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Number five, to another, the working of miracles. Number six, to another, prophecy. Number seven, to another, discerning of spirits. And number eight, to another, diverse kinds of tongues. And number nine to another interpretation of tongues verse 11 but all these workers that one and self same spirit providing dividing to every man how many people dividing to every man i said how many people every man severally as he will because of the importance of uh, this anointing, the abiding anointing, and the active anointing, and the appropriate anointing for our ministry. Next week, by the grace of God, if Jesus tarries, I'm going to come back to this post John chapter 2, verse 27, and talk about the real anointing. It will be like an anointing service. We'll be anointed in Jesus' name. And the anointing of the Spirit, if you are cold, warmth will come. Fire will come. And if you are being kind of sluggish, I don't know how to operate this and how to operate that, the oppression of the Spirit will come upon every life in Jesus' name. So next week, Tuesday, by the grace of God, we will concentrate on just the anointing. I need anointing. I want anointing. I desire anointing. It will come upon you mightily and powerfully in Jesus' name. But for today, number one, he has given to us the word of wisdom. You remember Jesus said when they bring you uh, to those uh, council members or whatever, do not think of what you are going to say. The spirit of your father will speak through you. He will give you a wisdom and a mouth that no opposer will be able to gain say in Jesus' name. He'll give us also the word of knowledge, like Ananas and Sapphira came, and Peter said, Is it for so much you have sold the land? And they said, Yes, for so much, nobody will fool you with a lie. And nobody will deceive you with a lie. And then Peter said unto them, Why has Satan filled your heart? He had the word of knowledge. And then the Lord will give us, number three, the gift of faith. He said, Why could we not cast that uh, spirit out? He said, Because of your unbelief. Because I say unto you that if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Our time has now come. I said, your time has now come. Every mountain in your local church, you will speak to that mountain. They will move away in Jesus' name. You speak to this mountain and if you doubt it in your heart, all things shall become possible unto you in Jesus' name. Number four is the gifts of the Spirit. And Philip went down to Samaria and he preached the word of Christ unto them. And the people seeing and hearing, he cast out devils, he healed the sick. And many people were turned to the Lord and there was great joy in that city. The Spirit of God is going to come upon you. The anointing of the Lord is going to be activated in your life. In your community, there will be great joy of salvation great joy of healing and great joy of deliverance in jesus name and the walking of miracles the walking of miracles that time has now come back in your life miracle 
it's not just that somebody here is uh, preaching and praying uh, and you are receiving miracle. Yes, you will, but through you, through your hand, miracles will be done. Miracles will be wrought, and the power of the Spirit for miracles will be activated in our lives in Jesus' name. And then he will give us, the next one is prophecy, the gift of prophecy. But you know, there are people that uh, think that uh, prophecy, prophecy is saying uh, it will rain tomorrow, it will not rain tomorrow, or it will be this, it will be that. But let's look at what prophecy we're talking about in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, I'm reading from verse 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And reading from verse 3, the Lord will put that spirit of prophecy upon your life. You will prophesy good into the lives of your members and lives of the people you come across in Jesus' name. Chapter 14, 1 Corinthians verse 3, and he, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. You will edify the people you speak to. You will comfort the people who are sorrowful. You will exhort the people who are looking back. They will come up in Jesus' name. Number seven is the discerning of spirits. Evil spirits will not deceive you. Occultic powers will not have any hold on you. As they are coming, you will know that is of the devil. And you will trample upon every spirit of the devil in Jesus' name. The time has come, every demon will be under your feet. Every devil will be under your feet. Very shortly, it will happen. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And the God of peace shall bruise the devil under your feet shortly. And the peace and the God of peace shall bruise all demons under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then uh, diverse kinds of tongues, diverse kinds of tongues. You'll speak the language of men and the language of angels. And that language Satan will not understand. That language evil spirit will not understand. In Mark chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. It says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them. Who are they them? And these signs shall follow them. I said, Who are they them? I can't hear you. You'll be among us in Jesus' name. And this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take off serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And when and they went forth, like you are going forth tonight, they went forth, I said you are going forth, at the weekend you are going forth, and from now you are going forth, you are going forth with anointing, you are going forth with power. You are going forth with the gifts of the Spirit. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word of signs following. Confirming the word of your mouth with signs following. Number one, the word of wisdom. Number two, the word of knowledge. Number three, the gift of faith. Number four, the gift of healing. Number five, the working of miracles. Number five, number six, the gift of prophecy. Number seven, discerning of spirits. And number eight, diverse kinds of tongues. Number nine, interpretation of those tongues. Do you remember what actually brought the fulfillment of all the dreams that Joseph had? 
it was interpretation. He had his own dreams. Some people did not understand. He had the right interpretation. Then he was in Potiphar's house. And he was taken to the prison because of the lies told against him. And those two men had dreams they didn't understand. He gave interpretation. And then one of them that came out of the prison was now a Pharaoh. And Pharaoh had a dream. And magicians were not able to interpret. Astrologers were not able to interpret. And that man said, I remember my fault this day. There is a man in the prison. He interpreted for me. Let's call him. And they called Joseph. And Joseph came and the king said, are you able to interpret? He said, God will give Pharaoh an interpretation of peace. And then the dream was told and he gave the interpretation by the Spirit of God. And Pharaoh said, can we find a man like this in whom the Spirit of God is? He said, you'll be next to me on the throne. He gave him the ring of authority and he made him ruler over the whole lawfare of Egypt because of the interpretation the gifts of the spirit will catapult you to a higher realm i will take you to a higher place in jesus name all these gifts we're going to expand and we're going to go deep into it next week because your time of achievement has come your time of accomplishment has come and your time of power manifestation has come it can start tonight I said it can start tonight, the powerful anointing of a life-saving commission. Why don't you stand up and say, Lord, let it start with me tonight. Let it start with me tonight. Let it start with me tonight. But remember the commandment of God, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Remember the warning, Antichrist is coming, and the spirit of Antichrist is now in the world. Don't allow that spirit of antichrist to control you or to influence you and then you come into your anointing you will do wonders as you go forth in the power in the might of the lord in jesus name are you there open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer